Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm gonna show you exactly how I made $10,000 with my CNC in less than 90 days. So seven years ago, when I was first getting started with my CNC, it took me over two years to make $10,000. But last fall, I wanted to test out everything that I've learned over the last seven years and launch a completely new company. So my wife and I launched the Nifty Bird Design Co. together last September, middle of September, and we, ended our selling season the beginning of December. This is how much money we made during that time. Now, keep in mind, we treated this new business as a side hustle. I have another full-time job. My wife has another full-time job. And so this was truly a side hustle that we worked on in the evenings and weekends. We also have a two-year-old and my wife is pregnant with our second and she was battling severe morning sickness. So if you follow this process that I'm about to share with you, I guarantee you can make $10,000 with your CNC side hustle before this coming Christmas. All right, step number one, take action now. Now, before you sigh at me and click off this video and like, oh, this is just some generic list, hear me out. From my own experience, the difference between making $10,000 before Christmas and not making $10,000 before Christmas is taking action. Depending on when you're watching this video, you have six months or less to make this all happen. So it's important to have a sense of urgency. Urgency, how do we get urgency? Well, we need to figure out our why. Why are we doing this? Why do we wanna expend energy on CNC and our valuable time? We have a limited amount of time. Why do we wanna spend it on CNC? And that's gonna be different for everybody. Is it you wanna save money for Christmas? Is it you wanna take your family on a trip? Is it you wanna have provide your family with a little more stability and financial freedom? Every one of those is a valid reason, but you have to decide it for yourself. And the reason this is so, so important, and I talk about this, is because there are gonna be times when you come home from work and you don't want to go out into the shop and make products to sell. That is the reality. You're gonna be like, no, I don't feel like doing that. But if you know your why and you keep it in the forefront in your mind, you will be like, you know what? I am saving to take, I wanna make some extra money because I wanna take my family on that vacation. And that is what will power you through those times when you don't feel like doing it. All right, step number two is a little more exciting and that is spend the next two months prototyping. Take the pressure off sales uh, and it's just simply a time to prototype, to practice with your machine, to iterate and get better. But I know a lot of you will struggle with this step because in my recent audience survey that over 500 of you took, uh, your number one challenge was not knowing what to make. For us in the Nifty Bird, we are constantly prototyping. We spent more time prototyping than anything else, and we sold a lot of different products. But this one was our top seller, and has been. The interesting thing about our lanterns is they didn't start out as lanterns. They started out as gift boxes, customized gift boxes that had, I had this idea where it's like you wrap a wooden gift box, a Christmas gift box where you'd wrap up a present, but it had a uh, wrapping paper uh, on the outside. So like you would laser engrave and it looked like wrapping paper. I iterated on this for a long time and eventually we came to a smaller lantern and then a bigger lantern, but we also made and continue to prototype a lot of other CNC products. Okay, so if you don't have any products, you really need to jump on this prototyping. And what you're looking for is you're looking for the crossroads of your interests and the market's demands, the market need, the market wants, what the market values. So your interest with, and aligning that with the market, uh, what people are willing to pay for. The best way to figure that out is to start making things, to find inspiration, whether online or in stores, or Instagram or Facebook groups, find inspiration, something that excites you, start making it. That's not the final product. A final product has never been created on the first try. So create something knowing that you're going to improve it, you're going to change it. And I'm setting aside two months, set aside two months to go through this process. To help you, here are some characteristics of good products. Now I talk extensively about this in the CNC side hustle, which is my online course, but here are some bullet points to keep in mind um, that will get you headed in the right direction. All right, a good product brings up a memory or an emotion. Over 95% of purchases are made on the emotional level. They're not logical. We think as our products through a logical standpoint, but most of them are emotional purchases. 
Number two is it has a utility. It can be used. It doesn't just look good, but there's actually a function. Number three is it solves a problem for somebody. Uh, I think we get really bent out of shape, like, oh, I got to solve a problem, like, I got to cure cancer. Well, no. A simple problem that you can solve that people are willing to pull money out of their pocket for is someone needs a graduation gift to take to a, gradu a high school graduation party. That is a real problem that you can solve with a product. And number four, your product appeals to several different buyers. So just a few examples, they can buy it for themselves, they can buy it for a loved one, they can buy it and give it as a gift. Uh, there's a lot of different scenarios, but you don't wanna just appeal to one buyer. It's really hard to get any traction there. You wanna apply to a lot of different situations and your product can uh, fulfill the need of any one of those scenarios. So during the two months, try to come up with five to seven uh, product ideas. Now these can be iterations of one base product or it can be several different products. It's okay to take inspiration from other people's work. You do not need to, and I would actually argue it's impossible, to build something completely original, never been done before. And I would actually challenge you to think about a product that you think is an original product. I would almost guarantee you that the product that you're thinking of, whatever came into your mind, is actually not the original. It actually was uh, someone took inspiration from that product, put their own twist on it, packaged it in a different way, made it out of a different material, positioned it differently in the market, and that is what you're seeing. Woodworking has been around for thousands of years. From the very beginning, people have been working with wood and the, the probability of coming up, up with an original product in woodworking is extremely, extremely rare. So if you're struggling to come up with product ideas, keep this in your mind, write this on the wall. Successful products are iterations and mashups of previous products that a customer finds valuable. All right, step number three is join a community of people that are doing or have done what you want to do. One piece of advice is connecting with people that are doing what you want to do or have already done what you want. I don't think there is any more powerful thing to do. The mutually beneficial relationships that are formed in communities, it drives everyone higher, further, faster, and pushes to limits that you never thought would be possible. All right, step number four is be obsessed with getting feedback about your product. Family, friends, online communities, the people that I just talked about, uh, people doing their, or have done what you want to do. Be obsessed with getting their feedback. Now, we're looking for honest feedback. We're not looking for people just to pat us on the back and be like, wow, it's so great, you did a great job. We're actually looking for target market, real customers, like potential people that would actually buy what we're making and be like, hey, what do you think about this? Honest opinion, you're not gonna offend me. This is how we refine our product and make it the best it possibly can be. And other people tell us things that we would have never thought of ourselves and we're like, wow, that is a great idea. Not every idea is a great idea, but look for patterns. And if people are saying a lot of the same things that we need to consider either making a variation or making uh, uh, implementing their suggestion in some shape or form, but uh, I'm not saying the customer is always right, but definitely this is how we make a product the best we possibly can. All right, so we're well on our way to making our 10K and uh, let's recap where we're at. So we um, are about two months in, two to three months in, so that right now it is um, April, so May, June, July, perfect, we're in July. Uh, now it is time to open an Etsy shop and create some quality listings. We, we have our prototypes, we spent three months prototyping, getting feedback, now we're ready to open an Etsy store and start creating some listings. So you may be wondering, what is a quality Etsy listing? Well, one, we need to have quality staged photos. Uh, we need to do some SEO research, and then once we have one good Etsy listing, we need to duplicate that 10 times. And then we need to change the lead photo to be different. So every listing is the same product, but it's a different lead photo. And we need to change the SEO and uh, tags and um, the title. We do this to cast a wider net, right? Uh, so many people fall into the trap of creating one listing uh, for one product and you think like, hopefully people find that product, right? But if we create 10 of them, people are much more likely to find 
your products. So here's an example. This is what the Nifty Bird Etsy store uh, currently looks like. It's currently offline. We don't sell this time of year. We only lean in uh, September through the end of the year. But you can see what we did. We duplicated our listings. We did it based on color uh, of lights. And so this is what we're trying to do. All right, let's move to number six, which is to attend at least one craft fair before September. So let's say our timing is July. We have July, August. Uh, and so before September, we want to attend at least one craft fair. Now, I'm assuming that you haven't done a craft fair before. If you have, then you already have some experience, but it's still a good idea to get more experience. So this craft fair, you should not be worried about sales. One of the common traps that I see people do is they put all this effort into building up for a craft fair, which it's a lot of effort. And then they sell $100 worth or $50 worth and they're like, it wasn't worth the time. And they never do it again. And the reason was is because they're gauging the success on sales. Your first craft fair, you sh your first two, three craft fairs, really shouldn't be gauged on the number, on the money that you make. That is like me jumping into an NFL game as a wide receiver and wondering why I got crushed and had zero catches for zero yards. Obviously, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I don't know what to expect. So we need to get some reps in before the holiday season hits. And so I recommend doing that July, August. It doesn't even matter the event. Uh, just go set up and learn. So if we're not focused on sales, then what should we focus on? Well, the first thing we should focus on is learn how to sell in person. Number two, we need to look for new product ideas. We need to constantly be in this feedback loop and iterating to make our products the best that they can be. Number three, we need to work on our booth setup, how we like to set things up. Uh, it's always a good idea to get things really vertical. And so uh, setting up our table and tearing it down and just getting practice with that. Number four, we need to get used to pricing our items. How are people reacting um, to our prices? Are they balking at it? Do we need to lower the price? Do we need to raise the price? Is this our target market? Am I in the right area of town? All those things factor into price. And so we need to learn. Uh, that way we can apply what we learn later. And the last one, again, you might imagine, is probably the most powerful, is networking. Generally network with other people at the shows, other vendors at the shows, people selling things. And it doesn't matter if they are selling the same thing as you or not, go talk to them and just get to know them. For example, I have met a lot of people at craft fairs and my network has grown massively just from the people that I've been set up next to um, for a weekend. We've just chatted. Last December, I was set up next to an IRS agent, came to know, come to find out. Um, a candle lady, a soap lady, a broken glass artist, and we talk. Oh, what events are you going to next? Listen for things like uh, people that have experience and that have done this a lot. They'll, they'll say like, oh, wow, your products would do really well at such and such event. Those are the things that we need to listen to and we need to put ourselves out there for this first event and collect all this information. All right, so I've got two more steps here and the next two are where we make our money. We've invested a lot of time and money into this, and this is where it's all going to pay off. So think about the first uh, six steps as practice. This is where you put in the reps, you went to practice, you got better every time, and now it's game time. Now we're going to put it all into practice, and our goal is to make money. Step number seven is coming up with our game plan and making our final tweaks and applying little things that we learned from craft fairs. What's happening on Etsy? Is there a, a, a particular listing that's doing well? Do we need to adjust SEO? Uh, if there is a particular listing doing well on Etsy, uh, consider throwing $5 behind it on Etsy ads. And not on all listings, just do it on that listing. So consider other things. Do I need to improve my setup, accepting payments, all those final little details, right? Like how are we gonna engage with customers? The next thing we need to do is using the information that we've gathered on events, specifically talking to other vendors. Are there other events that we need to attend? What, what not to attend? And we need to research and sign up for four prime events. And there's five keys that I want you to consider when looking for these events. Number one, ask yourself, do my products fit into this event? Does it make sense 
uh, for me to go there with my products. Number two, sign up for markets that are going to happen between October 15th and the first week in December, say December 7th. Number three, preferably they're indoors and not outdoors. There's nothing worse than putting all this time and effort into prepping for an event and then it gets rained out. Number four, the event has been happening for more than three years. Like this isn't, we don't wanna attend first time events. If you hear anybody say, hey, do you wanna attend my craft fair? Uh, it's the first year we're having it. Run the other way. Do not waste your time. Number five, only attend events that are well known and well attended. I can't overstate the importance of those last two. The Number one contributing factor to craft market, craft show success is the type of event that it is. So if you get this one wrong and attend low quality, low uh, attended events, uh, you end up wasting a lot of time and money. I've been there. I, it's not a good feeling. All right, step number eight is to prep for and crush the four events that you signed up for and those Etsy listings, it's time to reap what we have sown and what we've practiced for. So this includes making enough product, engaging with customers, talking to them at these craft fairs, like getting their attention, having conversations with them. If that's not you, then bring someone who can do that. Bring a helper, you should bring a helper anyways to these craft fairs, because it's really hard to do the checkout process and gift wrap process and bagging process, all that. You, probably, you should have a helper with you at these events, especially if they're highly attended. Next, we need to stay on top and ship Etsy orders on time. I can't tell you how important it is to get good reviews on Etsy. And so ship them on time, get good reviews, interact with your customers, and make them happy. So that is the exact process that we use to launch the Nifty Bird and make over $10,000 in less than 90 days. If you wanna dive deeper into this process, I do that in my new course, the CNC side hustle. This is where I walk with you step by step on how to make, market, and sell the products that you make on your CNC. If you're interested, click the link in the video description below. A couple months ago, I had the opportunity to interview somebody who makes more than $18,000 a month with his CNC machine. Click this video right here to see that interview and see how he does it.